344, 345, 346, something like that. Um, Scrimger shows up. He actually shows up a little bit before that. But Scrimger shows up at the Weasleys during their uh, Christmas holidays. And um, wants to talk to Harry. Okay. So um, Scrimger says, all these whispers of a prophecy of you being the chosen one. Now, notice a couple pages before that is when Scrimger shows up and starts talking to Harry. They're just kind of beating around the bush. They're not getting to the point. And Harry now realizes, now we're getting to it. I, I assume Dumbledore has spoken of these matters with you. Harry says, yeah, we discussed it. Have you? Okay, okay. And then Harry says, but that's between us. So, no, 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 I, I don't want you to divulge anything. You know, just, I mean, it doesn't really matter that you are the chosen one, right? Harry has to mull that one over for a few, for a few seconds. I don't really know what you mean, Minister. Well, of course, to you, it will matter enormously. I mean, so notice, he says, in any case, does it really matter whether you are the chosen one or not? That's an interesting question. What do you mean? Because like later on in the office when um, Harry's talking to Dumbledore about it, he says it doesn't, like, it, Harry said it's like one way of being like thrown into battle, like, um, yeah, like, okay. Like walking in really. Okay, I see. Yeah, and we're going to talk about that part extensively, okay? But that's not what Scrimger means, no, is it? Scrimger doesn't mean that at all. Harry's like, what do you mean? Come on, speak clearly, you know? Well, of course, to you it'll matter enormously. I mean, if you are the chosen one, because the chosen one refers to... What's chosen one in English translation of, by the way? He's the chosen one. He's the anointed one. He's the, you know, not the son of God, not that kind of, don't go all crazy over that. Okay, so he means chosen one. You are the one chosen to defeat the Dark Lord. It doesn't really matter whether you are, but well, of course, to you it will. Why? Because you're the one who has to, you know, be the one to defeat him. But to the wizarding community community at large, it's all perception, isn't it? It's what people believe that's important. What does he mean? It's what people believe. Perception is reality. Big issue in not only the United States anymore. This is an issue worldwide, or at least in Western countries, that have a relatively free press. Fake news. What's fake news? How do you know whether or not fake, something is fake news? Because what does he say before about what people believe? It's all a matter of what? Perception. What is perception? Perspective. It's how you see things. What determines our perspective? What determines how we see things? What, does, what determines how we take this part off? What determines how we understand this, Kel? How it's presented to us. You guys are all, you know, quote unquote, children or, or um, citizens of the internet age. I mean, all of you, it's safe to say, maybe one or two exceptions, born after the invention of the internet. I don't mean the internet, internet going back to DARPA in the 1960s. I mean internet 1990, 1991. Okay? I go back a whole long time before that. I go back to where 
you know, if you wanted the news, what were your sources? Either newspapers or if you turn, we don't have one in here anymore, you turn on a TV, what did you get? ABC, CBS, NBC, that was it. That was literally it in terms of news. Right? You had the three national networks, and then you had your local news station. Then the local news would be on for half an hour, and the national news would be on for an half an hour after that. That was it, other than newspapers. Right? So the perception was guided by what? The people behind those three. And now you have those three and then quote unquote internet news. CNN came on came online in 1980. You know, it was a brave new world, so to speak. Fox News came around shortly thereafter. Actually, not that shortly. It was what, 1988, 1990? I think it was even later than that. Um, it was later than that, much later than that, 98 or so. Okay? Fox News came around in 98. MSNBC comes around after that. And then, you know, Fox News Online comes. And then headline news. And now you can literally spend your entire day just watching news. From what perspectives? Take your pick. <laughs> Take, it's a smorgasbord approach. Rather than going to a restaurant, you can eat this, this, and this. Now, you can eat what's at this table, at that 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 table. So you can have, quote unquote, far right wing news, and you can have, quote unquote, far left wing news, and you can have everything in between. Okay? It's all a matter of perception. Well, what perception, what, what, what's the source of the perception for the wizarding community? Daily Prophet. What else are we told about? Quibbler. Quibbler. What else? Which Weekly, which is probably something like People or Us Magazine. Okay. There's the wireless radio of sorts. Okay, because we know the Weasleys listen to that sometimes, at, you know, for music and such. We're not told if there's much quote unquote news commentary on there, though we are going to see a scene in book seven where it is being used for that. But it's it's pretty limited, right? Okay. So why does he say it's what people believe that's important? What's What's that stand in opposition to or in distinction to? Well, that's part of this. What do you mean by reality? Truth. What's the fact of the matter? You know, go back to this for a minute. What's the difference between this and, or what's this in, in distinction to? Supposedly, Real news, true news, factual news, etc. Okay? Notice, Harry doesn't say anything. He th thought he saw dimly where Scrimger was going with this. <coughs> but what does he do? He doesn't say anything. Why? Because Scrimger's one of those idiots who's going to do what? Going into silence. You give him enough rope, he'll hang himself with it. Okay? People believe you are the chosen one. You see. They think you quite the hero. So, they believe, they think. Remember the other day we finished with a question, kind of finished with a question that Harry raised? At Christmas, it's the same Christmas. This is just like a day later, where he's asking exactly, where he's asking Lupin and Mr. Weasley, how do we know? No versus this implies what? This implies fact. What 
does this apply? Blurred lines. Opinions? Blurred lines? Possibility? People who are religious people. They don't talk about knowing often. It's belief, right? Why is it a belief? What's, what's lack? What lacks? Evidence. Proof. Facts. Proof to me God exists. You can't. Right? Not in the evidentiary sense. You can't say, here, look, this is a God particle. Okay? Rowling's going to bring this whole idea up in the next book. In a little interview that they have with Xenophilius Lovegood. Okay? So, they think you're quite the hero. Which, you, of course, you are, Harry. Notice, he kind of gets the impression, I think, if, if I were to film this, when he says, they think you quite the hero. I think Harry's got to make an expression like, come on, man. Haven't I already proven myself? I mean, go back to the first book. Ooh, a thirst to prove himself. I've done it. I've got the scars, literally. Okay? Which, of course, you are, Harry, chosen or not. How many times have you faced you must not be named? That's a rhetorical question, by the way. Well, anyway, I mean, the point is, you are a symbol of hope. Well, who else called him that? Dobby, book two. He says, Harry, you are a beacon of hope. What's the difference between a symbol and a beacon? A beacon shines out brightly so that everybody can see it. A symbol? Eh, you got to be one of the initiates into how the symbol works in order to pick out the symbolism. Hmm. The idea that there is somebody out there who might be able, who might even be destined to destroy, he who must not name. Well, you know, it gives people a lift. What does that mean? It gives people a lift. Makes them able to get up out of bed in the morning. Because otherwise they think he's coming after me. And I can't help but feel that once you realize this. Once you realize, Harry, that you are what for the wizarding community? Hope. That you will do what? That you have a duty to stand alongside the ministry. And I never connected this before, but man, it's huge. Captain America, the films. He gets almost the exact same speech. Okay. And what does he say? I don't really care for how S.H.I.E.L.D. is acting. You know, I'm going to bring it down if I have to. I mean, in the, in the one where, you know, S.H.I.E.L.D. reveals itself, Hydra reveals itself in S.H.I.E.L.D. and all that kind of... Uh, um, we're soldiers. I was going to say civil soldier. No, that's not right. That's a mashup of the two. Which would be cool. But, right? Because what's going on there? They're trying to use the nature of public property. They want Harry to put on what? The spandex and get the shield. And perform. And, and perform to sell, you know, bonds, so to speak. They want him to put on the spandex with the big, you know, lightning bolt on the chest. And go, look at me, I'm your... So that people will feel some kind of hope. I don't understand exactly what you want, Harry says. Now, I think he does, entirely. Okay? What does that mean, stand alongside the ministry? Well, well you know, nothing onerous. That is, it's not a nine-to-five job. Just, you know, every now and then, popping in and out of the ministry... Imagine for a moment there were a real Captain America. What do you think most people would want to see? Him every now and then popping in and out of the White House. Right? Or the Pentagon being involved. Or if there were real quote-unquote Avengers. Yeah. We'd want to know they're around. And? Active. And? On our side. Not... For themselves. And of course, while you're there, you know, you could speak to Gavin Robards, head of the Auror office. What's he doing there? I know you want to be an Auror. We can, you know, 
grease those skids. We can make that happen, Harry. What's that example of, by the way? I think bribing corruption. We'll make you an or you won't have to do it the legal way. Dolores Umbridge has told me that you cherish. Mm, he shouldn't have said the name Satan. <laughs> so you'd like me to give the impression I'm working for the ministry. It would give everyone a lift to think you were more involved. What's Harry's quote unquote job first and foremost? Occupation. You're a teenager. Student. He's a, he's a student. He needs to finish. The chosen one. You know, it's all about giving people hope. The feeling that exciting things are happening. The feeling. Feelings can be what? Wrong, misleading. But if I keep running in and out of the ministry, won't it seem as though I approve of what the ministry's up to? Well, yeah, that's kind of, but I don't. I, I don't like some of the things you're doing. Uh, you locked up Stan Shunpike. Now, who is Stan Shunpike, and why do we give a rat you know what about him? Kid on the night bus. He's just dumb. He's just a Joe Blow. He's just your poor average schmuck who happens to be a wizard, not a very good one probably, because he's a teenager and he's not in school. Do the math yourself, you know. And what have they locked him up for? Being a death eater. I would not expect you to understand. These are dangerous times. Certain measures need to be taken. You are 16 years old. Here he's like, get it. Dumbledore's a lot older than 16. He doesn't think Stan should be an Azkaban either. You're making Stan a scapegoat. Literally, what is a scapegoat? You have to go back to the Old Testament. You get a goat. You put all the sins of the community on that goat. You drive it outside the city limits. And boom! You blow its head off. You sacrifice it. So that all the sins of the community are forgiven. That's what Stan has become. I see. You prefer, like your hero Dumbledore, to disassociate yourself from the ministry. I don't want to be used. Ouch. That kind of stings when you read it in the light of Book 7. I don't want to be used. Some would say it's your duty to be used. Yeah, and others might say it's your duty to check people that really are death eaters before you chuck them in prison. You're doing what Barty Crouch did. He's doing what who else did? Fudge. Doing what Fudge did. Pretending everything's lovely while people get murdered right under his nose. You're trying to pretend you've got the chosen one working for you. So you're not the chosen one. Notice, it's almost like Scrimger slash Rowling sets the whole interview up to get Harry to accidentally admit, yes, I am the chosen one. I'm Jesus. I'm back. I'm going to kick it. So you're not, I thought you said it didn't matter. Whether I am or not, you said it didn't matter. Not to you. Anyway. I, I, I shouldn't have said that. Here's like, no, you, it's good that you did. A little honesty, you know. Come on. Okay, this is an interview, right? Harry's trying to get him to be honest. What interview are we going to see fairly shortly after this? Dumbledore's office. In comes L.V. himself. And Dumbledore is going to say, Come on, Tom. Try for some honesty. Tell me why you're really here. Same thing. Different characters. No, it was honest. One of the only honest things you've said to me. You don't care whether I live or die. You do care that I help you convince everyone you're winning the war against Voldemort. Notice, here's what you care about. That everyone thinks we're winning the war. I shouldn't go here, but man, it just pisses me off so many ways. 
And I know a couple of you guys are vets, so I apologize if I anger you. But we just had four soldiers killed in Afghanistan. Why the hell are we still there? I mean, seriously. I understand the Taliban, but that ship sailed a long time ago. If, if we want to win the war, what do we, quote unquote, need to do? Kick some serious. We, we got to stop treating them as our allies, essentially. Because another American shouldn't die over there. That's kind of the point Harry is getting at. He is saying, we have this war. It's a serious war, right? I mean, in the novel. Voldemort's a baddie. What are they really doing? Really? How much how much yeah. aid is the ministry giving Dumbledore? Yeah. He's putting out propaganda. They're putting out propaganda. Larry? Like when we were told, you know, what was it about? I don't know. Seven, eight years ago. We've got them on the run in Syria. And then what happens? Boom. ISIS comes out of nowhere, seemingly. Or we got them on the run in Iraq. And ISIS comes out of nowhere, takes over half of northern Iraq, most of Syria, and just seems to be... And what are we told? No, oh, it's not a problem. They're, they're the JV team. Well, their JV team seemed to be kicking our varsity team, you know, until, until we got serious. Until you say, okay, let's ease these rules of engagement a little bit. Let's let's let our soldiers fight without one arm tied behind their back and one leg tied to the other. He says, you don't care whether I live, I don't whether I live or die. All you care is that I help you convince everyone you're winning the war. I haven't forgotten, Minister. This isn't, you know, up the man. This is what's he doing. I don't remember you rushing to my defense when I was trying to tell everyone Voldemort was back. Do we know anything about Rufus Scrimger then? He was head of the Aurors. And what were they doing? Following Fudge. The ministry wasn't so keen to be pals last year. They stood in silence. So Scrimger asked, what's Dumbledore up to? No idea. You wouldn't tell me? Nope. Well, then I shall see whether I can't find out by other means. What, what does by other means always mean? I'm going to spy on him. Harry, you go ahead. <laughs> you try to do that. Why? Yeah, yeah people have tried before. <laughs> you seem cleverer than Fudge. That's like saying... Uh, <laughs> I, I wasn't going to choose catfish. I was going to choose a lower level of life, slime, you know. So I'd have thought you'd have learned from him his mistakes. He tried interfering at Hogwarts. He's not minister anymore. Dumbledore's still headmaster. You might want to put those two together. So it's clear to me he has done a very good job on you. What does Scrimger mean? Brainwashed. You've been brainwashed, kid. You've been indoctrinated. Dumbledore's man through and through, aren't you, Harry? Potter. Yeah, I am. Yeah, he is now. But when this comes home to roost in book seven, that changes. But he's going to come back to it. All right? So, a sluggish memory. What is that sluggish memory? Memory of Tom. Tom Riddle coming to Slughorn and asking him, how do you make a Horcrux? First, what is a Horcrux? And well, and then he asks that too. Okay. So Harry goes to Dumbledore and talks to him about Malfoy and Snape and, you know, tries to, you know, weasel information out from Dumbledore. And Dumbledore is not a, you know, catfish <laughs> to have weas information weasel out of him. So... Uh, they go into another memory, page 361 and following. 
Dumbledore tells Harry about Tom Riddle's friends, about Tom Riddle at school. Very smart, very well liked, does great in all of his classes, but Dumbledore doesn't trust him. Okay. So Dumbledore talks about, you know, gathering memories of people who knew Tom Riddle. He says, and they're hard to find. It's hard to get access to these. He says, here's one I was lucky to get. Okay. And we see Morphin. Hmm. And Morphin is speaking with Tom Riddle. We come back out. Harry says, um, why'd it go dark? What happened? Because Morphin could not remember anything from that point onwards. When he awoke next morning, he was lying on the floor, quite alone. Marvolo's ring had gone. Meanwhile, in the village of Little Hangleton, a maid was running along the high street. Why? Tom Riddle Sr. was dead. His wife was dead. And Tom Riddle Jr. was dead. Muggle authorities were, were perplexed. They, they still don't know how he died. Okay? So the ministry called upon Morphin. He admitted it. Okay. He admitted the murder on the spot. Harry, so Voldemort stole, stole Morphin's wand and used it against his own parents. Yes, he did. So when I said, because I completely forgot about this, in Priori and Cantatum, when the people are coming out of Voldemort's wand, his parents wouldn't have come out. Excuse me, his father and grandparents wouldn't have come out because they weren't in, so to speak, his wand. So, another memory. Dumbledore says, uh, excuse me, talking about this memory, Dumbledore says, I extracted this memory with difficulty. When I saw what it contained, I attempted to use it to secure Morphin's release from Azkaban. In other words, he took the memory to the ministry, he got the wrong man. And what happens? Morphin died. Morphin died. Harry says, um, they talk about magic and such, and Dumbledore says, whatever Morphin was, he did not deserve to die as he did, blamed for murders he had not committed. Now what is, notice what that tells us about Dumbledore. Does he tell us oh, Morphin was a saint? No. We know Morphin wasn't a saint. What's he concerned about, though? He died for the wrong crime. He died for crimes that weren't his. He shouldn't have those crimes still on his memory. Okay? So, he says, Harry, one more memory. A young horse slughorn. There's Tom Riddle. Tom Riddle asks about horcruxes. I don't know anything about Get out of here, you smart kid. Dumbledore says, that's not the real memory. I need that memory, Harry. We can't do anything else until I get that memory, Harry. So you get the impression every time Dumbledore sees Harry, what's he going to say? Working on that memory, Harry? I need that memory. So, birthday surprises. We're going to skip a bunch. And in fact, we're going to skip most of this. So it's Ron's birthday, 1st of March. Ron takes, you know, Romilda Vane's um, love potion thingies. And they drink the poison. Harry solves the problem. Chapter 19, Elf Tales. Let's see, I think we can skip a lot of this. Yeah, we can. Chapter 20. Yeah, let's get on. Lord Voldemort's request. So, um, begins with Harry talking with Luna. Um, and he goes on to Dumbledore for a lesson around, what is that, for... Around, I don't know, 425, 426. Dumbledore says, so you're working on the memory here? He says, yeah, I, I went to him. I, I asked him at the end of potions. I, I asked him about, you know, 
if I could have that memory. And he wouldn't give it to me. Dumbledore says, I see. And you feel that you have exerted your very best efforts in this matter. You've exercised all your considerable ingenuity. You've left no depth of cunning unplumbed in your quest to receive the memory. What does he mean? No depth of cunning unplumbed. You haven't tried to trick him? You haven't lied to him? You haven't bribed him? Because cunning implies, you know, not necessarily using legal means. And he won't use legal means, right? When it finally comes to it? What's he use? Liquid lust. It's liquid love, actually. Or liquid luck, sorry. My misery. Liquid luck. Yeah, I guess it's legal. Here's a here's an interesting question. Do you ever really get the impression, within reading all the course of the novel, that it's entirely acceptable to use a potion on someone without that person's knowledge? Like, for example, a love potion. Generally, it's not. Or a charm. Usually when charms are used, charms are used on inanimate objects. Right? When they're used against people, they're, they're generally hexes. Because charm implies what? Unicorns, daisies, fuzzy animals. Hexes imply, you know, cursed and scarred. It's just kind of interesting that she doesn't, Roland doesn't come out and say, you know, using potions and such on people are illegal, but it's it's implied that unless they agree to it, shouldn't because it removes an element of their free will and after all what does the imperious charm do takes away their free will entirely yeah yeah that's true So it puts him in the right place in the right time, and it does what? It gives him the good luck. Well, said earlier, it's like later on, he says that it wouldn't, the potion wouldn't have helped if it wasn't already possible. No, I'm, I'm trying to remember how um, the context. Because he wanted, Harry wanted to use it to get into the room with the fire and the Right. Mouth, right, right. Okay, okay. We'll talk about that when we get to it. So. Dumbledore said, and Harry's like, well, no. No, I, I, no, I'm sorry. I just, what did he do? He just went right up to him and said, you know, can you? And he got, you know, kicked out of there. So, he told them, and Dumbledore says, didn't work, et cetera, et cetera. So, Dumbledore tells Harry a couple pages later, now we're going to get to some memories and some issues where things were a bit murkier. So when they first started off, he said, you know, everything I told you last year was fact. And where we're going now, we're going off into memory. And I'm not quite 100% sure, but he starts with 99% sure, 98, 97. Now we're getting down around the 50%. I'm really fudgy here. So he says, I've got two more memories, Harry. And I'd, I'd like your help to draw conclusions. Okay. So he tells, he prepares Harry for the first one. He says, Voldemort reached his seventh year, as you might have expected, top grades, everything, classmates deciding what jobs, Voldemort's working at Borgen and Burks. Harry's like, wait, what? Because what's Borgen and Burks? Well, it is now. It's a pawn shop. It's a pawn shop. People, you know, run a little tight for money, go in, take your wedding ring, get 10 bucks, come back, go in, take your thousand year old, you know, necklace that belonged to your great, 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 great and get 10 galleons. All right. So Dumbledore says Riddle wanted to stay at Hogwarts. Why? Top of 431. Um, 
He said he's been closest to the school than he's ever been to a person, more attached to the school ever than to a person. Secondly, so that's the first reason. He's never been attached to a person, first of all, but he's been more attached to Harvard's. Second, Castle is a stronghold of ancient magic. Surely Voldemort penetrated a lot of it, but there's still a lot yet to be penetrated. Third, he would have great power and influence over young witches and wizards. Okay. Harry, but he didn't get the job, right? <laughs> Notice how he asked that question. He doesn't say, did he get the job? It's, he didn't get the job, right? I mean, you're telling me Voldemort was never... No, of course not. Okay. So, went off to Borgen and Burks. They go to the pensive. And what do we see? We see Hepzibah Hufflepuff. Uh, Hepzibah Smith, sorry. Do what? She comes in and she is sweet talk by describe Tom Riddle at this point. Handsome. Tall, young, young handsome. Young, okay. Doesn't look like a snake. Doesn't have slits for a nose, you know. And he talks her out of Helga Hufflepuff's cup. Okay, so we're gonna skip a bunch. Hokey gets convicted for the murder of of uh, Hepzibah, okay, and Dumbledore tries to get, you know, Hokey, you know, off, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. so he says, okay, so now Harry, they come back out of the memory, he says, now let's, let's look at the facts of this case, I hope you notice two things, Voldemort had committed another murder, begins in the paragraph, now said Dumbledore, if you don't mind, Harry, I want to pause once more to draw your attention to certain points of our story. Voldemort had committed another murder, whether it was his first since he killed the Riddles, I don't know. I think it was. This time, as you will see, he killed not for revenge, but for gain. He wanted the two fabulous trophies that poor besotted old woman showed him. What were they? He already has the locket, right? Where did he get the locket from? Okay. He got the ring from Morphin. It's a lock in the cup. Yeah. Um, just as he had once robbed the other children at his orphanage, just as he had stolen his uncle Morphin's ring, so he ran off now with Hepzibah's cup and locket. Harry, but why? He's risking his job for those. Okay. What did these objects mean to him? Harry, you must admit it's not difficult to imagine that he saw the locket at least as his, right? I mean, what did they have on it? Slytherin crap. So it had belonged to another founder of Hogwarts. Because Harry asked, why the cup? I think he still felt a great pull towards the school, and that he could not resist an object so steeped in Hogwarts history. So there are other reasons, and I hope to demonstrate those. So, last memory. They go in, there's a young Dumbledore sitting at the headmaster's desk, arm and dip it as gone the way of fl all flesh or somewhere else, and Voldemort walks in. His features were not those Harry had seen emerge from the Great Stone Cauldron almost two years ago. Not as snake-like, eyes not yet scarlet, face not yet mask-like, and yet he's no longer the handsome Tom Riddle. It was as though his features had been burned and blurred, waxy and oddly distorted, whites of the eyes now at a permanently bloody look. So, Riddle comes in. Good evening, Tom. Won't you sit down? Dumbledore offers him courtesy. Thank you. I heard that you would become headmaster, voice slightly higher and colder than it had been. A worthy choice. Glad you approve. May I offer you a drink? That would be welcome. I've come a long way. How long, by the way? Yeah, from Albania. Southeastern Europe bordering on Greece and Macedonia in those countries, okay? The Balkans. So Dumbledore pour, pour, pours him some booze. So Tom, to what do I owe the pleasure? And Voldemort slip, slip, sips his wine. Believe me, I've had none. I just can't talk anymore. He said, they don't call me Tom anymore. What's he mean? 
Don't call me Tom. I don't like that. It's like, you know, gives him the willies. These days I'm known as, I know what you were known as, Dumbledore cuts him off. He doesn't let him finish. But to me, I'm afraid you will always be Tom Riddle. And I could be wrong, but I, I kind of think there are little elements there of what Harry says to um, Dudley at the beginning of book five. But to me, you'll always be Ickle Dickens. This is Dumbledore's way of kind of putting him in his place. It's one of the irritating things about old teachers. Notice what he's just done. He's reminded them, I used to be your teacher. That they never quite forget their charges of youthful beginnings. I see you, and I see the little 11-year-old kid in the funny little shorts. Almost as it were. He raises his glass as though toasting Voldemort. Nevertheless, Harry felt the atmosphere of the room change. Suddenly, Dumbledore's refusal to use Voldemort's chosen name was a refusal to allow Voldemort to dictate the terms of the meeting. And Harry could tell that Voldemort took it as such. Okay. Question. Now, I'll admit... No, let me ask the question first. Based upon our understanding of Harry up to this point, Harry's mental development, his ability to pick up on things, his ability to see patterns and all that kind of stuff. Does that fit Harry's character? To understand the kind of psychological dynamic of what is going on in that room, Kill sitting there going, nope. To me, it doesn't. Because we're going to see in, in the next book, Harry's going to be having conversations with Ron and Hermione, and they're going to look at him kind of like, like Ron did when Hermione suggested Harry teach him a defense against the dark arts. Like, no, no, he's too stupid. He's, he can't. And here, he's analyzing this kind of situation and seeing what Dumbledore has just done is he's done what? He's asserted authority over the situation, and he's not going to let that conversation go in a way he doesn't want it to go. Nevertheless, excuse me, Voldemort says, I'm surprised you've remained here so long. I always wondered why wizards such as yourself never wish to leave the school. Dumbledore, yeah, I like teaching. Okay, So, I believe you've been offered post of minister three times. Dumbledore admits, at last count. But eh, it's never attracted me as a career. Notice, the ministry never attracted me as a career. Power never attracted me as a career. Book seven. Voldemort, I have returned later than expected, but I've returned to request request again what he, Dippet, once told me I was too young to have. I've come to ask you that you permit me to return to this castle to teach. I think you must know I've seen and done much since I left this place. I could show and tell your students things they can gain from no other wizard. Dumbledore, hmm. I certainly do know that you have seen and done much since leaving us. Rumors of your doings have reached your old school, Tom. I should be very sorry to believe half of them. Now, how old is he at this point, Voldemort? He's not been gone very long. I don't think Dumbledore says it's 10 years. He says... You think it comes, it's, we're told after, later, that it's 10 well, I years? He, no, I thought Voldemort said um, he returned later than Dr. Stigma would have expected. He just says later than expected. And I thought somewhere it said 10 years. Because Dumbledore tells Harry that Voldemort asked in his final year, essentially, can I stay and teach? And because Dumbledore, you know, puts a bug in Dippet's ear, Dippet says no. So he goes off, and then he comes back, you know, a few years later. We're not told how many. I think it's early 20s. I don't think it's more than five or six, probably. Okay? Could be wrong. So, 
Dumbledore says, yeah, I've heard about the stuff you've done. I really hope it's not true. Greatness inspires envy. Envy engenders spite. Spite spawns lies. <laughs> Come on, Dumbledore, you know this. Why does he say that? So you know this part. Because you've been at the end of somebody else's spite, and that spite is caused by other people's envy of your power, and that envy is created by your greatness. They want your greatness. So greatness inspires envy. Envy engenders spite. Spite spawns lies. You are a good example of this. Dumbledore. Let's go back to the beginning of your statement. <laughs> you call it greatness, these things you've been doing? Certainly. I have experimented. I have pushed the boundaries of magic further, perhaps, than they have ever been pushed. Now, what do we know he's already done by this point? He's killed a few people. And probably made a few Horcruxes. Because we know he made Horcruxes when he killed the Dragons. Or at least one. We'll, we'll talk about it in just a moment. I pushed the boundaries of magic further perhaps than they have ever been pushed. Notice, I've experimented. Some kinds of magic. Of some. Of others, you remain, forgive me, woefully ignorant. The old argument. What's that tell us? Something you've heard before. They've been around this bush before. What's the old argument? Love versus power. Love. Love. Yeah, love versus power. The old argument. In other words, come on, man. We've talked about this before. But nothing I have seen in the world has supported your famous pronouncements that love is more powerful than, than my kind of magic. Notice, nothing I have seen, how do we know? Well, one way we know is empirical observation. What you see, what you test, what you touch, feel, taste, etc. So, nothing I have seen, where? In this world, two qualifications, has supported your famous pronouncements that love is more powerful than my kind of magic. Okay? So, he's kind of saying, I've gone around and looked. And I haven't seen anywhere in this world where love is more powerful than the kind of magic I do. What does he mean by powerful? Does he mean effective? Like, <laughs> kind of a thing? Control of wills and things, like Tolkien calls it in his essay on fairy stories? <coughs> Dumbledore, perhaps you've been looking in the wrong places. Where's he been looking? In dark magic? No, that's not what he said. He says, I've, I've looked in the world. Dumbledore says, perhaps you've looked in the wrong places. Where has Voldemort possibly not looked? In himself. In himself, possibly. That's what I was hoping to get to at the end of the possibility, but okay. Where else? In others. In others? Where has Voldemort seen love in others? Death Eaters? No, that's more fear and respect. His parents? His mother wouldn't even stay alive for him. His father abandoned him. Kind of got what he deserved, you know. <laughs> Where else? Mrs. Cole? She took him in. She was a drunk and didn't care. She was a drunk and didn't care, but she fed him. She, she clothed him. She did take him on outings twice a year, which all the other kids got. Is that a form of love? 
responsibility? What could she have done? Okay, she could have been more. I mean, the opposite of that. What's the other? What's the flip side? She could have put him in a trash can when he was born. Should have, you know. Okay, she could have done a lot of things to him, but she did. She did give him a place to live. How about the person sitting across the table from him? Did Dumbledore have to offer him a place at Hogwarts? No, he didn't. Do magical children have to be offered a place? No, they don't. It's a choice. Never really trusted him either, though. Yeah, but he allowed Would you? <laughs> didn't tell a word to anybody else. He didn't, you know, have him come in and go, oh, by the way, keep an eye on this kid because, you know, he likes to torture his friends, so-called, and animals, collects trophies, you know, fingers, eyeballs, ears. Right? What did you mean in himself, Travis? Look inward, kind of. He sees it as weakness. How do you know he's never tried to love others? He, he sees it as a weakness. Why? Because he's Tom Riddle, was it? Uh, no, it was Barty Crouch Jr. that said it. said decent people are so easy to manipulate. D decent people are easy to manipulate. Okay. It would make him more or less predictable. Okay. He didn't want to be vulnerable. He didn't want to be vulnerable. Because what happens when you're vulnerable? You die like his mother did. And she couldn't have been magic because she died. So if you don't want to be vulnerable, then you have to be strong, okay? But look inside, look inward. In, in, in one of the passages of the gospel, somebody comes up to, you know, somebody says something to Jesus. Oh, it's Nicodemus. You know, Christ is talking about, you know, being born again. And he says, the kingdom of God is within. You got to look inward. It's not out there. You're not going to go out and go, You got to turn inwardly, etc. And I'm not saying Rowling is suggesting that. I think it's possible because of what she said in a couple of those, you know, interviews and such. Perhaps you're looking in the wrong places. Quit, quit looking out there. Quit treating it as something else. Okay. Now, notice again. He's saying. Nothing in the world has supported your pronouncement, love is stronger than my kind of marriage. <laughs> what did his mother's love do for him? Zip. Rowling has said, and I meant to look this up again, and I keep forgetting. Rowling has said, I think it was, it was either an interview or in Pottermore. The one of you have this, um, correct me on this, if you can. She said that Voldemort is incapable of love. He cannot love. Right? Anybody know why? Because he was conceived under a love potion. Now, one of you came up to me at the end of class the other day and said, so Voldemort's essentially a rape baby. Right? I mean, if he's conceived out of love because it's a love potion, that's like a rape baby. So if he's conceived under a love potion and therefore is incapable of love, then this is where it gets a little dangerous. Can we extrapolate from that? Is Rowling saying that if you're not conceived in love, you are incapable of love? Because if she is, that's a hellish idea. What about all the people that are conceived as a result of one night stands? Good. One night stand, that's not love. That's just raw animalistic lust. But that's how Harry views it. Because at the end of the last book. No, that's not how Harry views it, is it? But she made that statement 10 years after the last book. Mm -hmm. So, and I kind of think everything she says after doesn't apply to what's in the books. But is she saying that now? That. He can't love because he wasn't conceived in love. Yeah. That's 
To me, doesn't have to be to you. To me, that's Nazi level wrong. Because that means that there's a hell of a lot of people in our world who were born psychopaths. Not my experience <laughs> of knowing people who are born in situations like this. Okay, maybe not a love potion. But, you know, fill it with whiskey, fill it with vodka, and it becomes what? A love potion for a night. All right, we'll stop there. Didn't get quite where I needed to, but...